Welcome to the Being Human UT podcast, where Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas will discuss issues relative to the humanities and technology at Utah Tech University. And now your hosts for Being Human UT podcast, Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas. Welcome to the Being Human podcast. We are here today for our October episode. I'm Randy Jasmine, joined by my partner, Jim Hendigas. And Jim, we are talking AI again. Well, oh imagine boy. that. Yes, we're talking about it again. And I'm, I'm constantly promising myself that I'll be more optimistic about it. And I, I am. That's good. That's Ish. good to hear because maybe I'm, I might be heading in the other direction oh, no. so we can balance each other okay. out as we have done in the past. We're very happy to be joined today by Dr. Mike Peterson of the English Department here at Utah Tech. Mike has been at Utah Tech slash Dixie State for 10 years. He's been our department chair for five, and he has embarked on some research into um, generative AI, chat GPT, other programs that students might use in the classroom. And it just felt like, you know, we're marking pretty much the year anniversary since we started talking about this topic. And it seems like for several months, our talk, our talks and our discussions and our public forums were all about, well, we need to find out what happens. We're going to maybe try this. We're going to maybe try that. We need to find out what's going to happen. And I just feel as though maybe we're starting to get to the point where we're getting some results and we need to think about pedagogy. We need to think about how we do our jobs based on what we're seeing um, other people have experiences with. So um, on that note, um, Mike, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of your work in the uh, in this uh, exploring AI. Sure. So uh, unlike Jim, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, maybe overly optimistic. So um, yeah, I started my research in March. Um, I kind of was late to the game. I didn't even, hadn't even heard of ChatGPT until halfway through the spring semester, and I just happened to see a video on Dolly, or Dolly 2, it's the AI program to help you generate stuff. And so the next day in my 2010 class, English 2010, uh, I didn't have much planned, so I decided to just have them play around with Dolly 2, come up with images that they could potentially use in their research papers. Um, had a great time with it, and from there I decided, you know, this might be worthy of more uh, research, so I got IRB approval. So I'm working spring, summer, and this fall. I'm collecting essays and artifacts from students, um, and I'm having them write a lot of reflective pieces about how they're using AI, what's working, what's not, and then, um, yeah, hopefully next year I'll have an article or something written up about it. So it's it's kind of coming from a uh, perspective of the students and their experiences. Yeah, um, it, it, absolutely. And I've been approaching this from the very beginning as pro AI, I guess you could say. Um, uh, you know, as a tech university, I've, I've been telling people we would be doing our students a huge injustice if they graduate never having been taught how to use AI effectively uh, and ethically in their courses. So I've been encouraging students to use it. I, I use class time to let them play around with it. Uh, I give them assignments that kind of force them to use it. Uh, but in the end, ultimately, they, they don't have to. If they want to write a, a paper, create something that doesn't use AI at all, they, they can. Uh, but I've had quite a few that have used it and have had interesting things to say about it. So, What kinds of assignments have you had them create using AI? One thing I did interesting over uh, the summer was just kind of a, a quick ad hoc assignment. Um, they had just written their rough drafts of a research paper. It's a critical analysis paper. And I posted an assignment in Canvas asking them to come up with an alternate rough draft using nothing but chat GPT. Hmm. Um, and I, I, we had talked a little bit about prompt engineering, so they understood you know, it wasn't just you know, put in your research question or one simple prompt and then submit what you get. You know, the, it was kind of a back and forth uh, as they created these. And that was a part of the assignment, too, is in addition to creating a rough draft, they had to come up with a reflective piece, you know, letting me know what their inputs were, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, and then they shared them with each other and got the responses there. And I had quite a few students who, after doing that, said, you know, they had never used ChatGPT, had never even considered using it for a paper, but, you know, they liked some of the things it came up with. And uh, I don't think 
any of them used it wholesale, but a lot of them took ideas from it, uh, organization things that, you know, that they hadn't thought about that ChatGPT came up with. I mean, it seems like within the conversation, the overarching concept of AI is that we are in charge of making sure that it's it's useful. And it also, I mean, in a lot of ways, it feels like it's not this kind of cheat code. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like, at least in the way that it was unrolled to us in the world, was that these, you know, the, the creators of this just said, look at this wonderful tool, and then we had to frame it in our classrooms. And... And it's good. I mean, the, the work that you're doing and the work that a lot of people are doing in AI is to help sort of not only, I guess, demystify it for the student, but also make it so that it's not something that they would think is either they're concerned it's cheating or they'll be kind of excited that, oh, it's it's cheating. And um, instead, you're using it as a, as a resource to, to enhance your, your work. So... Um, Good job, Mike. Yeah, well, I've got, <laughs> I've got two quick stories about that, if mm -hmm. I can share them. Um, I, the first one I've shared with a lot of people. So in the spring, when I first started talking to students about um, AI, I had asked students um, who had heard of ChatGPT in one class, and only one student rose his hand. And so I was kind of excited because I thought, well, I'm, I'm introducing this cool new tool to my students. And uh, we talked about it and we played around with it. And then I unveiled to them my new policy for the course, which was that they could use ChatGPT. And I just had a couple protocols in place for how they could document it in their their papers and get proper feedback from me. And uh, and I emphasize to the students, don't look at me as you know a grumpy professor who's trying to catch you cheating. Think of me as a curious researcher. You know, I want to learn more about how students use ChatGPT. In that same conversation, once the students felt safe and, and could see that, you know, I wasn't coming after him. I, a student rose his hand. He said, well, I used ChatGPT on my first essay, and he talked about it. And I said, that's awesome. You know, how did it work? And then another student rose their hand. And uh, after a few minutes, you know, seven or eight students rose their hands, and they all shared their experiences. And I thought it was interesting. I went from mm -hmm. one student had heard of ChatGPT to almost half my class now are sharing experiences, how they had already used it that semester. And so... My message to professors after that was not that students are liars, but they are using ChatGPT even if they're good at pretending they're not. And so instead of forcing them to you know, find ways to use it sneakily, let's teach them how to use it effectively. Um, and then the other story, just a quick follow-up to that, I did an informal survey of one of my summer courses. And in that one, uh, using the protocols I set up, only 10% of my students actually report it's self-reported using chat gpt throughout the semester but then i did an informal survey at the end and more than 50 percent of my students in that survey admitted that they had used chat gpt which means you know roughly i, I can't do math that quickly but um, a lot of students were using chat gpt but not reporting it and I, I don't know why because i set up a very safe environment for them and so i don't know if it was laziness or shame or what but you know I think the reality is there are a lot of students at Utah Tech who are using it, but not effectively because their primary goal is how to do it sneakily under the radar mm -hmm. instead of working with the professors to do it effectively. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I've had experiences similar to that where I'm surprised at how few people um, talk about using it or, like you say, even talk about knowing it. And this really goes to, and I even, you know, have seen some research presented by one particular colleague who suggested that they get, they're getting very little um, chat GPT use and, and uh, some of the, cons some of the, the, the realities that you raise kind of are in my mind thinking, are they doing it and just not saying they're doing it? I try to compare it to cell phone use in the classroom, but it's a little bit different because, you know, cell phone use in the classroom, they know is a bad thing or they have this perception that it's a bad thing. Yet, one, they still do it. And two, they frequently do it openly. But if you were to kind of call them on it and say, hey, is that class related? They would kind of say no and feel a little ashamed. So I think in some ways, they have that same kind of concept with chat GPT. It's bad and I'm going to get in trouble for it. But then it's not something that you just, you know, oh, let me let me pull out my chat GPT to do this free writing that the, the teacher has assigned. So 
it's it's interesting how their attitudes. It's going to be interesting to monitor how their attitudes kind of progress as this becomes more and more prominent all around us. Yeah, I mean, it's just that very human testing a boundary. It's just sort of, I mean, <laughs> like children, like just kind of putting their foot over the line just a little bit. Am I going to get in trouble? And that feeling that, oh, well, this is, and it was, I think it was very, it was presented early on as, wow, this is really cool, but also like, oh man, I don't think my teacher's going to like this. I think that was the vibe that was <laughs> generally presented was that like m my teachers are going to be mad at me if I use it. And, and so I think you're, whether you're the minority or not, Mike, in, in your approach, I, I think the average student thinks that, um, that chat GPT is, is, is they have to be sneaky about it. Absolutely. And, you know, not that students are reading articles about higher education, but if you follow the headlines in the articles, especially early, you know, earlier in the year when chat GPT blew up, you know, a lot of people assumed English professors and English teachers were, you know, going to be enemy number one, that we were going to absolutely hate it. It was, we were going to be afraid of it. It was going to be the, you know, threatening to our, our profession. Um, and that I just don't think is true. I, you know, a lot of the English teachers I've spoken to in K through 12, as well as the college are embracing it to some degree. Um, and I made it known to the provost early on that I was very much pro AI and, and figuring out how to get it to work within our programs, which I think is why he asked me to be on the AI task force, which uh, the first round we were in charge of kind of implementing uh, a mission statement, some policy, you know, at, at the university level. Um, and you know, of course, our, our policy is just very, you know, encouraging to professors to incorporate it, don't just outright ban it. Uh, and now we're being tasked, you know, um, our, our next mission is figuring out how to not just be good users of AI at the university, but actually be part of the charge for, you know, creating and finding innovative ways uh, of using AI. So, Well, and that, you know, you've, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can expand um, some, so, some more. Um, what are your suggestions to maybe the um, enthusiastic professor, the enthusiastic teacher who's getting to know uh, about AI and wants to use it. How do you develop course policies and really beyond policies, kind of relationships with your students in which you foster rather than destroy this, um, this feeling of trust between professor and student so they're not afraid to admit that they've been using chat GPT or some other form of AI? Sure. So it, it all starts with just the in-class conversations. Uh, the professors I've talked to who are the most maybe frustrated are the ones who either don't ever talk to their students about AI, or if they do, it's just simply to tell them not to use it. Um, my approach, on the other hand, you know, from day one, when I go over the syllabus, I, I talk about AI, and then I, I We'll spend a little bit of time in class, not every day, but every now and then, you know, I'll have students pull out their phones, their laptops, we'll go to ChatGPT or Dolly 2 or something like that, and I'll, I'll walk them through it, have them play around with things, um, you know, and sometimes it's meant to have a critical lens, you know, to show them um, the ways that it fails, you know, that sometimes ChatGPT will create fake news, and, you know, if you ask it to, um, you know, find you direct quotes about something and, and it'll it'll generate a source and it'll have you know a, a url that you can click on and everything looks legitimate but it's not it's 100 percent fake and so you know we, i talk about those types of things with my students and you know how to get around that and um and, and so going back to your question you know i, I guess the simple answer is you, you got to have conversations with your students. You know, it's kind of that age-old question. If if you're not talking with your students about AI, then who is? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I think I, as you're, you were talking, I feel maybe I've leaned a little bit in that direction. And I'm curious as to how that affects my students' um, attitudes. Because um, uh, people who listen to the podcast are probably sick of hearing about my paraphrase obsession with AI. Um I'll have a passage from uh, one of the sources that we're using or one of the sources that a student has found and ask, you know, AI to paraphrase it. And, 
you know, you, you, I remember sitting in your office once, Mike, and you were talking about, you know, in your prompt to, 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 to chat GPT, you know, say, you know, write in this particular kind of style, write in this particular kind of, with this particular kind of voice. And I haven't experimented with that so much, but when I have it just, you know, here is a passage from this source, paraphrase it and um, put in proper APA citation what will generally happen is, I, I, I wish I had looked at this more systematically, and maybe I will start. I feel, as I, I've done this 20 plus times, I feel as if the paraphrases are always longer than the, the original. Not much, but slightly longer. And we usually get something that, if there are three main points in the passage, goes through the three main points in the order that they were presented, and is more wordy than than I would like it to be. And then I have my students say, okay, you did paraphrases of the same passage. Let's compare them side by side. So in some ways I'm showing them, like you say, the limitations of chat GPT, but maybe emphasizing that too much and not spending as much time on the positives could be sending the wrong signal perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I like that paraphrase act activity you're talking about. Uh, I do something similar in my class when we talk about style. Um, and, and I do emphasize to them, you know, that adding more words and more flowery words doesn't make it better. And that's what <laughs> ChatGPT often does. Right, right. That's what, and, that, and that's what students think they, they, they're being asked to do sometimes, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's, that's, I, I like some of the examples of, of assignments that you've been talking about, and, and I definitely think that I want to use it in, in a good light. I mean, I was writing a description of a class the other day, last week, and I was just kind of struggling with it, and I had come up with something that I knew was, was kind of wordy and not so good. And so I took that and I put it into chat GPT and said, make this passage clearer and more concise without changing the overall meaning and I actually liked what I got. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it didn't end up being the finished product, but it came pretty close. Mm -hmm. And, um, as I did that, I thought, yeah, this is what we want. Just not, not just ourselves, but this is the kind of thing we want our students doing with a tool like chat GPT, enhancing their thinking and enhancing their writing. Yeah. And enhancing is a good word. I, you know, I was, I was looking through, some of the preliminary results of my, my study that I'm doing and looking at some of the different ways that students have used ChatGPT. And um, the ones where, yeah, they give it a prompt and ask it to write an essay, those never pan out. And those are usually the ones where I tell them they have to rewrite it anyway because it sounds like a robot. Um, but the ones where I, I've been really impressed with their final product is where, you know, it's a combination of where the student writes it and then maybe they ask ChatGPT to you know, help them revise a paragraph or come up with new ideas. Um, and it's been interesting as I've looked at the inputs and outputs, you know, the, my students, if they use ChatGPT, I require them to take screenshots of their inputs and outputs. And so I can see what they're doing. And this also ties into the idea of the prompt engineering. And um, I think some students just get it. You know, I think at an instinctual level, they understand, you know, kind of the dialogic nature of it. And, you know, it outputs something and then they ask it something different and they, there's this kind of back and forth and then they use parts of that you know in the creation of their paper and and some of these papers have been fantastic um and so i guess my goal is to figure out for the students where that's not instinctual how do i teach them how to do that so that their default isn't just write me a college level paper and then they submit whatever it turns out because that rarely ever works before we started the podcast, uh, Jim, you promised to be more positive and upbeat <laughs> about AI. So let, let's hear some of that positivity. Um, oh, well, I, I'm glad you asked. I mean, I have. Okay, so I have been using it. I mean, in fact, last week I used it in my class, and I'm kind of still on. This is where I'm at with it. I love the idea that it can spark ideas. Um, you know, like here's my, my quick analogy. So we live in St. George and it's cold, um, uh, like for two months. And, and so I have this, uh, this little fireplace that I have to get the, um, the, the flame to, to go again, the, um, with the pilot. 
pilot going. And it's such a pain because I can't get that pilot going. Um, and I sit there and I'm like, why can't I get this pilot going? I have to sit there for like, click it on. It usually takes about five minutes of me just holding this thing down. Probably need to replace that. But I think that's like the student experience when you ask them to write a paper. Say, write an argumentative paper with, you know, these subtopics. They just draw a blank. They're just, it just takes them forever. With chat GBT, it feels like it just the flame immediately happens. It's just, and so in, in class, I was asking them to, to look at, we were talking about different topics that they could um, write an argumentative paper on. And I said, well, then type in, you know, a prompt that gives you the different points of view and almost everybody when it when it when it listed these different points of view on the topic most of the students were like oh yeah like i i would have come up with that eventually maybe with some inspiration but it to for me to see that it assists them it sort of it lights the fire of inspiration it gets them moving towards making a stronger argument or a paper to me, that makes me op more optimistic because I think, okay, it's actually helping them in the creative process. It's not replacing the creative process, which is was always my primary concern is that, you know, if you give someone an opportunity to not work hard, they will choose that option, <laughs> you know. But there's this part of me that thinks, okay, people still walk and people still jog, so the automobile didn't destroy our health. <laughs> um but it sure is very helpful in getting us to, to places. And, and so I, I, I have been using it. I am a little more optimistic of it. I mean, I still am going to hold on to that part that just says I, I kind of wish that they would go be able to have that process of discovery on their own without the assistance. But there's also this part of me that just says but if that assistance gets most of them further, I, I also think about the students that, never come up with a good thesis because they 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 just always have something that's that's really terrible <laughs> or i i also think there are some students out there and god bless them um they want to come up with something really innovative and it ends up being really not not well formulated and so with chat gpt it doesn't really i, I wouldn't say that chat gpt at least in my experience is incredibly creative it, it gives you kind of a consensus idea of, of the information that's out there. So it's not going to give you a thesis idea that, that is just totally out of left field. That's going to be a human-generated thing. And so it, I feel like, especially at the bachelor's level, it gives them pretty solid critical thinking. It, at least it, it, it lights that pilot. So there you go. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm more happy about it. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I like that metaphor. I think that metaphor works well. And, and, you know, you do touch a little bit on another one of the issues that I have, and that is, you know, the, the now almost universal use of this term generative AI mm -hmm. and, you know, people taking it for what that means in other scenarios, right? As I understand it in, in technology, it means it's a deep learning model that is able to produce a high quality response, whether in writing or in drawing, creating images that um, is based on, you know, the information it's been trained on. That's kind of the textbook definition of generative. But this idea of generative is seeping into our cultural thinking to the point where it's the inspiration. You know, this is this the, the inspiration, the thought is coming from AI itself. And that that part. I guess if I'm not negative about it, that part's a little bit scary to me because that is when people seem to want to, in certain contexts, in certain circumstances, substitute AI for critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So one thing I have to say about that is um, I think there's an assumption that it, it's all or nothing. So this student who was going to sit down and come up with all their own original thoughts and write this beautiful critical essay is now just saying, screw it, I'm going to have ChatGPT do it. Mm -hmm. and I don't think that's the case. I think the student who was over-relying on ChatGPT was the one who was going to over-rely on Google anyway. Um, and so this is just offering them another you know, tool uh, in that arsenal. And I think the student who was going to think critically about the assignment and put effort into it you know, if they are going to use ChatGPT, they're just going to, again, use that as a tool to do what they were already going to do. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I can definitely see that. I can definitely see that too. I just have a quick story of, about a friend who who, who teaches K through twelve um, in northern Utah, and she told me about some of the people in her in her school now. They'll have meetings where they'll be tasked with coming up with like a theme for the beginning of school or a theme for an academic um, um, unit. And in the past, these meetings have just been people kicking these ideas around about what would be the best theme and how does it connect to kind of things that we're doing. And she's telling me that more and more of her colleagues are sitting in the meetings and saying, well, you know, I just typed in the parameters into chat GPT and it says this. And so it's become this idea that again, you know, maybe I'm struggling a little bit with my thinking about this. And so I'm going to use chat GPT. So, um, I just want to say that let's make it clear that it's not only students that we're suggesting mm-hmm. might be advocating or, or, excuse me, abandoning the critical thinking process, because I think it's tempting for other people, too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm having trouble coming up with an idea. So I'm just going to let chat GPT decide what the homecoming theme is going to be for this year. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just I find that interesting that we're ready to point our fingers at the students, but there's plenty of other people who uh, who uh, are are advocating their uh, not duties, but their their uh, job in create in, in in critical and creative thinking. And and I hope to be one of those people someday. <laughs> um, it, AI hasn't gotten there yet, but I'm looking forward to the day when ChatGPT is trained on all of the. Uh, databases that are behind paywalls, you know, where it can look at everything in, you know, Project Muse and EBSCOhost. And and then when I have big questions, I can just ask it instead of spending, you know, hours and and months of my life, you know, going through articles looking for keywords. You know, I can just ask it a question and it'll pop up and it'll free me up, I think, to ask the even bigger questions as a researcher. When do you get to the point where your concerns that you expressed earlier about the creation of false sources and false information, when when do you get to the point when where those concerns have been allayed? Uh, what do you mean, like to the point where we can just... Well, I mean, if you ask it that question, wh- where do you when do you get to the point where you have the confidence that ChatGPT just didn't have a hallucination and give you a fake source. That's true, and that's why I say someday. <laughs> we're not, we're the not future, there yet. Yeah. In the future. No, I, I, I definitely understand what you're saying, and I think that that's a, a great goal that I think I hope the, the people who are creating this technology are striving for, but there could be a time when it might be hard to distinguish You know what is authentic human generated information synthesized via AI and what is, yeah, for lack of a better term. And if there's a new term, let me know. If they come up with a new term to take the place of hallucinations. I don't know if they have or not. So. Well, I mean, this, I, what I am grateful for is it's just this further, the, the conversations about AI in our classrooms further reinforce that our job as an educator is to you know, make sure that our students are thinking about the tools that they use and just not just buying in on it. And I think that story that you may, I mean, like, it's always troubling when we see people who probably graduated from college and you're like, you're, you're not going to just review what ChatGPT gave you, <laughs> make sure that, that it's, it, that you approve it. Um, making sure that you're always looking at something from a more critical lens, because that's what you've been trained on. And, and even if the tool is useful, you know, that you're always harboring a little bit of skepticism. Like even, I mean, I would assume that if you, in future Mike, um, w- would would use AI to be able to go into Project Muse. And if you found the sources that are very useful for you, then you're like, okay, well then maybe I'm going to pull them up and look more deeply into them. And so that, and, and you might find some discrepancies or a misinterpretation or, or at least an interpretation that was different than you. Um, but it's like we're only encouraging them to think more deeply, which is that's you know another thing that that I'm trying to be optimistic about is that I know that a lot of people will default to working l- less 
but I also think there's an opportunity for people to work more um, in, in they think more and, and, and to look more deeply into something. And so, I mean, I just human nature, I'm always going to be pessimistic of people that are just going to try and find the path of least resistance. But also there are going to be people that are very grateful that their research is enhanced by this tool. But yeah, I don't know. So I, I do want to add um, a little bit of pessimism. I, I, I can join your pessimism. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, you know, we... we we're dis- bringing two kinds. I, I was going to say, we had discussed earlier that Jim and I were maybe switching positions, and I feel as I have played the pessimistic card pretty heavily here. Well, so. that's good. It, it makes me... It feels better to feel optimistic. <laughs> so, so one area of pessimism I was thinking about the other day is... Um, so Steven Pinker has this concept known as the, uh, the burden of knowledge, and that's the more you know about a subject, the harder it is to remember what it's like to not know about it, right? Which is why experts in a field tend to use jargon and have a hard time dumbing things down for the rest of us. Uh, and I think I, I, all three of us, you know, most professors fall within that when it comes to our facility with writing. So I have yet to find a useful application for ChatGPT. I mean, I play around with it all the time for research reasons, but it has not in any way made my life easier. You know, it's much easier for me to open a Word document and just type whatever it is I want to type. Um, and, I, and, and I start to wonder, will this up and coming generation and maybe their over-reliance on ChatGPT ever get to that point where they can just open a Word document and write something, you know, persuasive, meaningful, just from their head? Um, and I don't know. I don't know if in the end we're doing a disservice to our students. You know, only time will tell. 20, 30 years from now, are we going to have, you know, professors that can write an email without AI helping them? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that brings me to a quotation that I found in preparing for this um, discussion we knew we were going to have with you, Mike. Uh, uh, I found it online attributed to an, an engineering professor named Josh Brake. But this is the question that I'm going to start asking. Now, this is broad and this expands beyond the concept of writing. For, but for those of us in writing, we're going to think about it in specific ways. And it sounds to me like you already have an answer to this. To what problem is AI the solution? You know, it, it, it just usually when we get something that as is talked about and I think inevitably is as revolutionary as what we're talking about with AI, it's done in response to a problem that needs to be solved. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. So thinking particularly of writing to what problem is AI the solution? I mean, I don't know if either of you have an answer to that, but I mean that really has kind of shaped my thinking about this a little bit in the in the little time that I've had since I read this quotation. What do you think about that quotation? That's a good question. You know, I would say maybe it democratizes the writing process. Okay. You know, maybe there yep. are, you know, people who uh, they would never have felt confident, you know, composing or, or coming up with things that, you know, now they do. So Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. And, you know and being self-serving, right? Now we don't have to sit on committees where people say, oh, you're the English people on this committee. You're going to be the one to write the final <laughs> statement because you guys know how to write. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now everybody's going to say, mm-hmm. I'll do the final statement from the committee. But well, still uh, have the English professor look over <laughs> yeah. when you're done. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I, I think that is, I, I think you're going to get a very different response from people outside of our field because yes. people will say, well, writing is, of course, you know, a, a necessary evil or it's, it's something that we have to right. do, but nobody wants to do it. Right. right. We're back to, you know, <laughs> almost a year ago in this very yeah. studio, you know, Curtis Larson, you know, talked about it as kind of being like a calculator. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's, just it's sort of like we'd waste time putting the numbers together when you can just press, you know, this, this, and then equals this. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they don't, we see, we expose the, the value of the writing process, but most people think it's time consuming and difficult and I don't enjoy it. <laughs> well, and the time consuming, that's another thought I have, you know, looking beyond the English aspect of it, you know, I, I follow a lot of Instagram accounts of artists who use mid journey, I think it's called, um, which is an art, creating uh, AI platform Um, and it's just amazing the stuff they come up with and you know stuff that would take months or years of their lives to create by hand they can now do in one afternoon and it just allows them to create 
a lot of really fascinating content very quickly. And so, you know, maybe that's a solution. Maybe that was the problem was, you know, as humans, we were very limited on our, our time and what we can create in that amount of time. And AI frees us up because all of us have, you know, 50, 60 great ideas knocking around in our head, but how many of them ever come to fruition? You know, it's a great point. It's a great point. I, 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 I like your responses, and I think, I think that there's a lot of validity to them. And I think that we've got to, you know, be thinking about those kinds of things. That and, and, and it connects with your, with your Pinker quotation earlier that we think about writing in a different way than other people do, and certainly in a way different than our students. And if they feel, I have actually several non-native speakers of English in my writing courses this semester and I, and I think about chat GPT in that kind of context and how useful of a tool it can be for them, the, you know, as long as I'm making sure that they're, you know, thinking creatively and expressing their ideas, you know, I mean, the one thing going back to our early conversations that I've absolutely done is my students are writing far more by hand in the classroom just because I want a, a sample of their writing voice, I want them to be thinking about ideas on their own. But then these non-native speakers of English can take that writing that they've generated and use the enhancing qualities of chat GPT and express themselves in, in, in powerful ways, you know, in a language that's not their first language. And, and when I think of that, I think of, you know, Mike, your comment about democratizing the writing process. And I think that, that there's tremendous potential in that. And maybe I can take it the other direction. And, you know, you know, when I'm, which I haven't done, I do a fair bit of reading in Spanish. I don't do much writing in Spanish, but chat GPT could be a tool that I could use in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, kind of a side note on that, just yesterday I had a conversation with one of my students from Cuba and she wrote a, a great essay, um, very well written. And she wrote it all out in Spanish. And, uh, I was able to look at it in Spanish cause I speak Spanish. And then she ran it through Google translate and the Google translate version was not very good, <laughs> but then she fed that into chat GPT and asked it to clean it up. I can't remember exact prompt, but then what it pumped out was much more readable, much more eloquent than what Google Translate did. But it was still, it was still her writing. She she composed that essay herself in Spanish, um, and then she turned it in. And she was a little worried and said, "Is this okay? I didn't write this in English." And I said, "Well, it's a composition class. All I care is that you compose the essay and that I can read it when you're done." And so. Well, that's uh, that seems like it's a great testimony right there, Mike, to the fact that you have you know, fostered an environment in, the, in your class where students are, you know, trusting you and, and seeing this as not being something that they need to do in the dark behind closed doors and not letting anybody know. That's, that's, that's inspiring to hear. I like to think I'm an inspiration. You are. <laughs> <laughs> you are in, in, in more languages than yes. just English. So. Yes. Your, your beard alone inspires me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it, nobody can see it, but I know. I wish this was televised. <laughs> well, we, we've offered, we've offered, but uh, I think it comes down to Sean's too nice to say. Randy, you just have a face that's made for radio, <laughs> a face for podcast. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I um, you know, one of the another reason for optimism that I, that I've sort of embraced is this idea that, you know, I, I, one of my, I was pessimistic initially. I know this is an extreme reaction, but I just thought I was going to show up the next semester and students were going to be like, why are we even taking this class? And just putting their, their foot up, up on their, their desk and be like, this is stupid. Like we're, we're, we're just going to do this in chat GPT. This is worthless. Like we're just walking over to the Dean's office right now and just saying like, I'm going to get an exemption from this class. And I think that's what those early articles were predicting. <laughs> that that's what students would do. So they were just going to be like, well, now that you're obsolete. And that was my terror. Um, and then I showed up to my classes and my students didn't really change. They still were curious. They still were a little resentful. They had to take a G course, but at the same time, they knew it was something that they needed to take and that it was going to help them in their college career. And so it's like I, I, I imagined this horror situation with my students, and 
it just did not happen. Like they, they just saw it. And I mean, like we started out this conversation, you know, I think there is that weird hesitancy of like, well, we're going to use it, but we're going to do it behind closed doors because I don't know what this professor, you know, is going to think about it. And so opening up that conversation, it almost feels like we're talking to like children about drugs if we're like, we got to talk to them before exactly. they go on the internet <laughs> to find out about this. Will, th- will there be, <laughs> will there be commercials about the, the, the right age to talk to your kids about uh, AI? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you did mention, you're like, we got to talk to this before somebody else does. Or so t- talk to them before they hear about it from somebody else. And it's like, that's what parents are always told about, like, these kind of topics. But <laughs> it, it, yeah, definitely. I, AI, um, I mean, I'm not still comfortable with it. I think where I've settled with is it I'm giving myself permission to understand that this is still so new that my feelings towards it are, are valid because I haven't processed it. And it's so influential on our field that I, I'm not going to make a, I, I'm not going to settle upon the feelings that I have on it now because I need at least maybe 20 years of experience with AI before I have a, and by then I'm hoping to be retired. But. Yeah, and, and my feelings change constantly. If you had asked me about it at 9 this morning, I would have told you it's the worst thing in the world. And so it just depends on the day and how many conversations I've already had about it. So mm-hmm. right now I'm feeling optimistic. But it's the weekend. <laughs> it's, it's Friday afternoon. Everybody feels optimistic on Friday afternoon. Yeah. Um, on a more practical level, and you don't have to necessarily talk to um, the current software that um, the university has, um, copy leaks. Um, how do you see? Do you, do you see any kind of innovation in software to detect AI that would make it so those? people who are uncomfortable and worried will at least know if their students are um, using AI or it's highly likely that they're using AI or do you think that's a losing battle for companies like CopyLeaks? I don't know that it's a losing battle. I've played around with a few of them and they're they're all kind of equally unreliable and, and students know how to get around it. Uh, um, I don't know if you've heard of the turn up the heat principle. Uh, I had a student tell me that when he writes a paper, he just asks it to rewrite it and turn up the heat, and then copy leaks doesn't pick up on it. Uh, so I played around with that, and the first paper I entered, it picked up that it was 100%, you know, AI. And so I asked it to turn up the heat, and I don't know what turning up the heat does. If it just paraphrases it or what, it, it adds more flavor to it. It definitely actually was better. So, you, so you, 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 in a prompt, tell yeah, AI I, to turn up the yeah, heat. Yeah, I said rewrite this and turn up oh, the heat. And wow. So um, it wow. added a little more flavor to it, and then uh, it only picked it up as 50% AI. Uh, and then I asked it to you know, paraphrase it one more time, and it, it dropped. And by about the fifth level of asking it to reword it, um, CopyLeaks wasn't picking up on it at all. Zero huh? percent oh. AI. Oh. Um, so, so, so it's turn up the heat. Uh, yeah, and, an and I don't Easter feel like egg? I'm revealing anything because my students know this. I learned this like, from them. Yes. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> and this goes back to my idea that instead of you know forcing them to spend their time figuring out how to beat the system, um, let's get to the point where they don't care what mm-hmm. CopyLeak says their percentage is. You know, teach them how to use it effectively. Yeah. And, not sneakily. No, and, and you know, I, like you said, I, I tried to phrase the question as, you know, I, I think naturally, and I would put myself in this category that we're just going to be naturally curious to know, yeah. you know, is this something where AI was being used if, you know, it wasn't a, a, a straight out assignment like the one you talked about where you, you know, are... are kind of setting up the steps of how to use AI. Yeah, and I don't know that we'll ever get to the point, you know, where detection will be good. But one thing that I, I've noticed, um, too, is there were a few assignments turned in over the summer that were clearly, I, I saw some earmarks of AI, but uh, the plagiarism software didn't pick up on it. And when I approached the student, uh, the students, none of them denied it. I just said, you know, this clearly, you know, you use ChatGPT, it's not well written, what can we do to make it better? And they all came up with a plan for revising it. Um, but when I've talked to other professors who have more you know, strict policies of no chat GBT, when they've approached those students, they, of course, you know, throw up their arms and they deny it 100%. Right. And so mm. 
Uh, I think it all just comes back to creating a, a classroom environment and policy that students don't have to get defensive so that when you say you use chat GPT, which is fine, but it's not well written, what can we do about this? They're willing to then go back and fix it and work on it some more instead of just getting their defense set up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and we're right back to kind of where we started, and that is, you know, fostering that environment in the classroom. You know, and, 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 and again, maybe it is similar to the use of of other technologies in the classroom, uh, just being comfortable with it and, and incorporating it effectively into your into your pedagogy. One I, thing I, I want to say real quick, sorry, Jim. Oh no, you. Um, uh, I, I not to be overly optimistic. There are times when it's just inappropriate. They should not be using ChatGPT at all, <laughs> like testing situations and stuff. So I, I, I writing, don't want... Writing personal narratives. Yeah, right. so I don't want people to think like every single assignment. Like I, I do let my students know like ahead of time, this assignment is not ChatGPT approved. This has to be 100% your own work. And so anyway, sorry, Jim. No, I was just, just going to add to what you said is that, I mean, I know it's kind of a silly example, but none of us, I think, would, would bat an eye about, you know, spell check or, or anything like that. And I know that's been talked about. And that's just sort of this assistive technology. Hmm. But I mean, um, that was just built in to help out you know, the writing process, but I don't know. I remember at least sometime in my early K through 12 experience that, I mean, spelling was really important. (laughs) I had lots of spelling tests. Um, and you know, now at this point, you know, that assistance isn't, you know, it's a given. And then it sort of tiptoed into sometimes just sort of predictive text on your phone. You're like, Oh, well, you're probably going to say this word next. And, you know, it, so, I mean, with a lot of AI, it, it feels like, you know, sometimes it seems like a drastic jump forward. But other times it, when I look at it, I mean, recently I've been thinking it's really just a re- an advanced Google search with, with, with good, with better writing. <laughs> yeah, this might be something, you know, 20 years from now, if archaeologists listen to this podcast, they'll just laugh that this was uh-huh. ever even a question. Like, <laughs> why were we ever concerned about AI? Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping. I really am hoping because, of course, all of us are terrified that that the the computers will take over us and get rid of us because we're obsolete. (laughs) That's always the grand fear. Yeah, those those folks who keep talking about critical thinking and all of that, we need to we need to kick them out of the republic. They're they're kind (laughs) of they're kind of like the poets used to be. Yeah, yeah, we don't need them. It's very it's very problematic. So. Well, um, Mike, thanks so much for visiting with us. Uh, We really appreciate it. Um, This is a topic of ours that um, we've talked about a lot, and I think Mm -hmm. you've added uh, another nice voice to the discussion, and and I'm glad that you're engaging in the project that you're engaging in, and I look forward to hearing more about your results. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. Thanks, Mike. Until the next time, uh, we'll see you again on Being Human, Utah Tech. This has been the Being Human UT podcast with Dr. Randy Jasmine and Dr. Jim Hindigas. Please follow and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. From Utah Tech University, this is the Being Human UT podcast.